As a Christian, can you look at porn or have addictions? It's a great question. In today's episode, we're going to talk about how to overcome addiction. What does the Bible say about pornography? And how can you not go through another 12-step program, but actually walk in the freedom that you are meant to have as a man on this planet? Welcome to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian business owners, thought leaders, and influencers where you can build not just a good business, but God's business where he is the multiplier of your success. In Deuteronomy 8.18, it says that, uh, remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you the ability to produce wealth, and it is him that we give the glory to as well. I got to bring in a phenomenal friend of mine that was a pastor leader making 30K a year, speaking this message of helping men quit pornography and get rid of addiction, went out into the business world and actually turned that passion and that message into a seven-figure run rate business where he's educating people on how they can transform their lives by getting out of the addiction of pornography and others and transforming their world. Welcome, my good friend, Sathya San. Sathya, welcome to the show, dude. Thanks for having me, bro. Excited to be here. Yeah, dude. I mean, it's great to have someone, King's Brotherhood Elite, here, this is what I love is that our guys inside of our community are guys that literally could be, I always say they could be the guys speaking on stage. In this fact, you actually, you're the one speaking on stage. And those are the types of people I like to surround myself with. So I appreciate you for, for not only speaking to the community, but also being a man invested in the community. I think that's really the coolest thing ever is, is having guys that do both, right? They're, they're not just speaking and they don't need brotherhood. They're not just brotherhood and they never can contribute, but they're doing both. So I want to honor you for that. Oh, thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. And I totally agree. I mean, uh, we're nothing without community. And what we're even going to dig into today, community is a huge part of it. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, I want to honor you for the business you've created as well. I know that at the recording of this, when when we first had connected, you were coming out of a church background, uh, a position there that was a, a salary style position. And yeah. I think it's very interesting because one of the things I think would be really cool for the guys to know is that your calling didn't really change just the vehicle that you were in to express that calling change, right? You're already working with people in these areas of quitting addiction, pornography, and have gone through your own journey, probably talking about it a lot. And now you're making an even greater impact potentially than you could have made before through yeah. reaching people through your own services and creating a business around it. Can you kind of like just just briefly like a one minute version of like kind of what what does the last couple of years look like for your movement of where it started to to where it's at now? Yeah, so I'm a pastor's kid, and when I gave my life to Jesus in my 20s, I mean, I grew up Christian, but you know, that's when I really committed my life. I felt a call to ministry, um, and I resented it my whole life or resisted it. I said, I'll never be like my dad. It was that kind of thing. But um, I really thought that being called to ministry meant I had to be in the church. And um, I eventually learned that's not true. And the reason it happened is because uh, I was a pastor. I was not making very good money, like 34K a year. I was engaged to be married. My my fiance was bedridden for like a year straight and doctors didn't know what was going on. I couldn't pay her medical bills. And I realized, uh, I like the term you use, like talking about calling. I realized that it's not that being at the church was not stepping into my calling, but I realized that if my calling was 25 stories high, the ladder I was climbing was only going to get me about 10 stories max. And I just realized that I could keep climbing that ladder, but at some point I would reach the top and I would realize this is a fraction of the person that God has made me to be. And I just could not bear the thought. So that's what really prompted me to get into business. I also had tons of prophetic words about being an entrepreneur. I don't think I've told you this before, but like probably for 10 years leading up to my decision to do business full time, tons of words. I just shelved them all. I'm like, yeah, I'll be like the pastoral entrepreneur kind of guy. And, um, and that season was where all those things kind of ignited and came to life. So it's been a wild ride since. I mean, the kind of money I used to make in a year is like my take-home profit in a month now. And um, and we're scaling pretty quickly here. So it's it's just, it's been a wild ride. I love it, dude. And there's many guys out there that are going through those transitions from one career to the next or one business to the next. And And I think one thing is that no matter what, where we come from, whether it's where we grew up or our friend group or our church that we go to or our previous position or previous company, previous partnerships, everyone knows you for like the box they put you in. So for you as a ministry box, what was it like the transition? How did you approach that with your leadership, with the people that knew you as the 36K year pastor who was called to maybe be in that spot? And then you're now 
running this business? Was that transition difficult? And how did each person take it? How did you approach the transition? So I was really fortunate to not have naysayers. Um, or if I did, they were quiet around me. So all the people I spoke to, like even talking to my senior leader, he was like, man, go for it. That sounds amazing. Let me connect you with the business guys in the church. They can help you out. So a lot of support that way. Um, I think the biggest opponent I faced was just myself, like tons of limiting beliefs. Uh, that whole identity shift, that's literally why I joined the Brotherhood. Uh, I, and I've been very vocal about this. Like the tactics are great. The speakers are awesome, but it's just the identity shift that comes from being around other guys who also have already embodied that identity. They're, you know, years ahead in their journey. That was the that was the biggest opponent I faced. It was it was myself um, because I felt like I, I wasn't smart enough. You know, I looked at like a Sam Ovens and I'm like, this guy was like Forbes 30 under 30. I'm past 30 and I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Like, who am I? You know, just like going through all that kind of stuff. That was that was the biggest hurdle I faced kind of making the transition. That's crazy, man. I, I could see that a lot of people have done the same thing. And and for you to, to immerse yourself in a community, and again, for the guys listening, that, that may not be the brotherhood for them, right? It's like, look, where do you find the, the place where you can step into a new identity? I remember Russell Brunson, he one time spoke at, at one of the mastermind events. If you haven't seen that one, it's before you join. And, okay. and it was very, very good. It was all about identity. And he talked about how he bought a bicycle. And for some reason, he never rode it. And then one day he decided like, you know what? I want to become a cyclist. He called it a biker, like Russell. That's like people that ride like big <laughs> Like Hell's Angels, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, let's call it a cyclist. And he went out and he bought, he embodied everything. He bought all the, the clothes that you wear, the helmet, the water bottle, the gloves, like the shoes, every single piece of it. So he could step into that new identity of I am going to become a cyclist. Right. And then he started cycling every single day. And so for every person out there, I think that's a really cool point is like how where can you step into a new identity where you're like this is who i am now i am healthy i am a great father i am a great husband i am a business owner i do profit every single month i do grow exponentially every month i am meant to have 100 fold growth 30 fold growth 60 fold growth year after year i am meant to have the decisions and knowledge and wisdom for each situation that comes my way because that is just who we are and when you start yeah. identifying with that, all of a sudden you start getting results of that, just as he probably became pretty good at cycling, but it took having the identity of a cyclist first, not just someone who had a bicycle. You're not yeah. just someone that has a business, but you're, that you're embodying a business span. So one of your guys' core message, and, and there's things I want to talk about inside of your business as well, is like, I think it's really amazing what you've, you've done. I think we, we stick on that for a second. You're reaching people, kind of talk, walk people through, what do you think is the biggest thing? Like, how are you reaching people? How are they connecting with you? And what do you think has created this success where you've been able to build the business, build the business that you guys have now? So we reach people primarily through media. Um, and that that's where being a pastor, like, you know, there's that scripture in Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for the good of those who are, love him and are called according to his purpose. Man, that's my story for sure. Like all the skills I used as a pastor, um, are so helpful now for what I do in business. And speaking is a big part of it, right? I used to do tons of speaking. So we we find people primarily through social media. Um, I'm building my own platform. I have a, a daily podcast called Unleash the Man Within. And then getting on other people's platforms as well, like an interview like this. Um, that's kind of how, we, how we're propagating the message. I've also been very fortunate to just have like links with national outlets as well. So I've been on TV quite a bit. And that kind of stuff. And I'm like, with most networks, they don't have a guy who talks about pornography a lot. And so I'm kind of like their go-to person, which is kind of cool because um, I get to step in and talk about it. But that's been that's been kind of how we got the ball rolling. It was a lot of podcast interviews. And um, I don't know, you're kind of throwing stuff at the wall to just see what sticks. And what's really changed for me. So at the time of this recording, I've only been doing the business for a year and a little bit full time. And what's really changed for me in the last year that's caused the business to grow is I've started saying no to a lot of things because I realized that my yes is only as strong as my no. And if I say yes to everything, number one, my yes basically has no value. But number two, it ended up, it just ended up spreading me super thin. That would be a great example of a ministry mindset versus a business mindset. And I, I don't, I don't think that's actually fully true. But what I mean is when I was in ministry, um, 
whether somebody told me to it, or you just pick it up, you kind of just say yes. Like if somebody's in need, you don't turn them down because you're a pastor and that's what you do. It's, it's kind of that thinking. And I had to really shake myself out of that. And if I stayed as a pastor, I would have had to shake myself out of that as well. It was It's, it's a lie through and through. But um, that's been the biggest thing, man. And so we're really dialed in now on social media. That's where we're kind of scaling. Um, and then just hiring hiring the right people, like cultural fits. That was something I definitely learned in the churches I was in. Most of the pastors I worked for, they didn't hire me because of my skill set. Um, they hired me because I was a cultural fit. And they knew everything else would come from that. And um, that's been really valuable for growing the business as well. It's interesting you say handling your no. Let, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And Right. And it's like you you can't say yes to something until you know what you've said no to in the opposite. Like if yes. you don't have any boundary around it, it's very difficult to know. Like what are you supposed to say yes to if you haven't said no to something or the or the opposite? How do you say no to something if you don't know what you've said yes to? And so when you yeah. know what your mission is, it's very easy to say no for things that don't align with that. And Jesus did it all the time. You know, it's like there's so many examples of him as this really amazing, nice guy. Yet, I'm sure that when everyone is begging him, trying to talk to him, and he's just walking through crowds, not sitting there answering every person's question, not taking every single person out to coffee, because he has three and a half years to like drive forward on a mission and, and get done what he needs to get done. We, we look at that the lady touched his robe and got healed, right? And he stopped for her, but was walking literally through everyone else. And there was other times where he didn't, right? Where he's called to speak and teach. And I think that's something to think about too with people is that, you know, once you start getting a little bit of momentum and you start think like, I go through it all the time, man. You're thanking everyone on social media. Hey, thanks for the message. Thanks for the encouragement. I'm glad you were impacted by this, blah, blah, blah. And like three hours goes by and you're like, I haven't pushed the mission forward at all. I feel uncomfortable. And so it's like, you know, you can't do everything perfect. I think Jesus was actually a pretty good example of that. Yeah. I also think a really good example is like inside of what you guys do, you guys are helping men for black and better words, get free of pornography, not fall into pornography, not allow it to have a stronghold over them. Well, I don't know if you have an example all scripturally, but it seems like very quickly throughout scripture, I don't know if it's the most dominant thing, but one of the most prevalent things is things like pornography or like a lust or like a, a sexual immorality or a tons of like David concubines, mm -hmm. Solomon, like that was the, the last part of his life. Right. It was like, he went from this like super wise guy that was doing all these amazing things to like super distracted with women. I'm sure that kind of continues playing out throughout scripture uh, so it seems like very high performing men that have taken making a big difference. A lot of them have struggled with this area. What for you, what was the reason why pornography? Like, why is that your message? Why is that your focus? Why is that the drum that you're playing? Why is that the, the thing that you're breaking people free of and speaking to? Why that over everything else? Why, how did that come about? So I think on the spiritual side of things, I really believe Jesus is coming back for a spotless bride. And I think we have some work to do. You know, um, the culture is hypersexualized. Pornography is rampant. And it's not just it's not just pornography. It's what pornography leads to. Like how many mega church pastors do we know of that have failed from sexual immorality in the last even two, three years? Like the number's astronomical and they represent many more pastors who just don't have a public profile. It's happening way too much. So that's a huge part of it. And I do have a special spot in my heart for leaders, you know, whether it's a pastor or a business owner, because I was a pastor that struggled with porn. You know, I struggled for 15 years and I was a pastor's kid that entire time. I was a pastor for, I don't know, maybe eight of those years. And man, it was, it was awful. It was debilitating. You feel, how did that conversation go? Like, you know, one, one thing I love is that our spiritual pastor and covering it is Pastor Steve uh, for King's Brotherhood, and you got to meet him uh, through our first brotherhood call together. And one thing that Brandon told me was that, you know, he was, and, and I, again, I may get this wrong, so people clip this like, this is my thought of it. It's like, he's very dumbfounded by like how high of a standard, like if a guy messes up in this area, and it's obviously dependent on the, how crazy is it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yet, yet it's like they remove their job, their title, their position, strip the church from them and leave them like barren away. 
Like, yeah. what was that process like for you? If you were this guy going through that, did you originally like confess this to your church? Like, did they find out later after you were healed? Like, are you going to walk me through that in, as part of your story as well? Yeah. So the first like full-time ministry position I had, when they brought me on, I remember feeling like this really deep conviction in my heart, like they have to know. So I told them up front and they were like, oh yeah. yeah that, I still remember I told the guy and he was like, yeah, he's like, you know, about 95% of the guys that have ever been on staff here have struggled. So that's okay. You know, and I remember just a sigh of relief because I thought maybe they would withhold the position. You know, I didn't know. And yeah. I was fortunate to to have those experiences. And I, I think, um, I, I think it's really healthy. Like, I think, I think if behind closed doors, people are confessing and they're working on it. I don't think they, I, I mean, again, it, it, of course it depends. There's tons of conditional circumstances, but I don't think people should be losing everything over it, but there has to also be a demonstration that like you're working at it. And I think that that's always where the gray area is, especially with like more prominent people because they don't have a lot of accountability for that kind of stuff. And they can quickly slip into that gray area of like, yeah, we know it's there, but I think he's looking after it. it he seems to be okay. And then turns out he was having an affair or something, right? So I think that's that's the main thing. Um, you know, the other the other part of this, like for me and why I got into this is because I know that, especially when I think about the people listening to this podcast, Nicholas, I'm like, I know there are so many destinies that have gone untapped because of pornography and other sexual sin. Like there's so many people who are performing at 60% of their capacity and it's not a skill issue. It's not a relationship with Jesus issue. It's not any other kind of lifestyle issue. It's that they have sexual sin in their life. That's not just like causing like a drain on their resources. It's distracting them. But it it also is like, I think God looks at it to a certain extent and he's like, I can only trust you with so much with that in your life because if it ever gets exposed, everything I give you is going to be lost. And again, that's only true to a certain extent because again, we have these pastors who are failing, who God has given them plenty. Um, so it's not that God just withholds it, but I do think there is more we could be tapping into. And I dream about the day when righteousness is a lot more normal, a lot more mainstream because um, it's not just for the sake of righteous being being mainstream. It's because when you have a men in a society that are tapped into their potential and uncompromising in their virtues and their values, man, you can change the world so many times over. And that's what really fires me up. Yeah, I 100% I agree. And for pornography in, in specifics, walk me through like, what is an example? Like, the, how many guys, we had talked to this before, like, how many guys think you th do you think have struggled with pornography at some point in your life? Yeah, I mean, I think guys that have actually that have struggled at some point, it's got to be like ninety five percent. The the five percent don't have electricity or something, you know. <laughs> but even the ones without electricity, you look at all these foreign countries, like a Muslim country that's like fully covered up, like they struggle with pornography terribly. When I remember a man and I, we went to Turkey. I think it was. Gosh, at some point, one of these countries is going to be super mad at me for talking about this stuff but um <laughs> and, and we went to turkey and i remember like putting my arm around her and we like almost got arrested wow was, like, there's not there's no public displays of affection none of that so so i think it kind of like rules out maybe let me know your opinion on this like like just getting rid of it and covering up everyone's body doesn't seem to be the way to stop it from happening Especially because I think over there, like people get like stoned for this stuff, right? Like people, like if someone were to like have sex at a wedlock and like, or have a kid, like don't bad things happen? Like, I don't know that much about their, their cultures, but I know it's not like super forgiving yet. Yeah. They, even with all the repercussion, no PDA covering up entire bodies, face, whole body. You don't even know what's underneath there all that's done is created more desire because they're yeah. like, I wonder what's under there, right? Like the, the man, man's imagination is pretty, pretty powerful. Um, yeah. You know, it's pretty terrible. Actually. I was watching house of dragons. Have you heard of this? No, I don't think like, so. It's basically like um game of Thrones, like before it ever got to game of Thrones. I think it's something like that. Oh, interesting. And it was terrible. Basically this is so bad, bro. Um, Basically, this guy brings information to the queen and and his reward is basically that he gets to like jack off 
to the queen. Okay. And like, because it was such a, an atmosphere of like super conservativeness, like they're covered up. It's very modest. All she would do is like show her foot or her ankle. And he would be like, that'd be enough. Right. Like that was like, (laughs) gosh, like I can't believe it. I'm seeing her foot. Right. So like no matter what, whether it was super exposed, like, the garden would have been really exposed, right? Like man and woman were naked and didn't feel ashamed. And mm-hmm. there's other places where maybe there's more exposure. I'm from California, bro. Like the beach is everywhere. Sure. And then there's yeah. like, and then there's other places like a Muslim country that's fully covered up and it doesn't really seem to solve the problem. So yeah. a lot of people think yes, modesty solves the problem. What we know a lot of these guys struggle with porn. One thing, I, one thing I want to ask about is like, what's a what's something you said that they're operating like 60 percent of their potential yeah maybe that part of that's out of shame i don't know what that is but why how do how would a guy know if they're struggling with pornography (laughs) just kind of funny but i'd love to know that and like why is it making them underperform okay so i think the key indicators of struggle are uh time spent um if you notice that you start planning around it or start craving it um, if you are observing that um, what you're watching is becoming more intense, the nature of the content, uh, like uh, if you look at some of the top ranking keywords and categories of pornography that are consumed, it's actually pretty disturbing. Um, like when I when I first got exposed and started watching, it was uh, it was really innocent stuff compared to the stuff that people typically watch now. So really good indicator. And then when it starts to impact your commitments um, and that, whether that's like you're showing up late to a meeting or, um, or you're canceling on your friends or, you know, that's, those are like the more extreme states of it. The reason it, it stops people from, from performing at their potential, there's a couple of reasons. Number one is we know that the, the best way, like you and I are at our best when we're in healthy relationships because we're just social beings and that's relationship with God relationship with others, relationships with our clients, our employees, whatever. And pornography is shown to reduce your capacity for meaningful, intimate relationships. So that is first and foremost. Um, I think on a secondary level, pornography eats away at your soul. Like you are giving away so much of yourself to your screen, whether you're just clicking here or there or you're binging for hours on end. And in the process, people lose their motivation, they lose their purpose, uh, they lose any kind of hope for the future. We know all of these things are necessary for you to be successful in your life, whether it's business or something else. And then I think the last element, um, we were talking about this with a, a friend the other day, but like the, the Bible is pretty clear that like sexual immorality impedes somebody's ability to inherit the kingdom of heaven, you know, to get their inheritance. Like, so there's a, a huge eternal component to this as well. And I think, um, I think that's often overlooked because porn is just so like normal, quote unquote, or it's common. That's the word I prefer to use. And I think people forget that there's eternal ramifications to this as well. And I'm not one to judge. I can't make that call. But all I know is I would rather position myself to not be at risk. And so I think those are the things that make it, you know, really dangerous. What's it like knowing that 95% of guys, and you had said statistics show like 60 to 80%. More surveys struggling. are in that area. Yeah. Maybe in that, in this current environment, what's it like going through your day when this is like your mission and you're talking to tons of dudes and you're like six out of 10 minimum are like struggling with this right now. How many, like if you were to talk to six out of 10, how many of them would actually come to you and, and talk about that they have a problem? Bro, this is so funny. Like you want to do a social experiment? This is like one of the best things because um, everybody always gives the same response. And it's always, oh yeah, I used to struggle with that. But so many people have told me I used to struggle with it that I know from statistics alone, at least like half of those guys are lying, right? Because it's just, it, it's inevitable. And and I know how addictive it is. Like I was addicted for 15 years. Um, I think I think that's that's a, an interesting point, and I don't know if this is where you were going, but I think it's worth mentioning that a lot of guys hang their hat on like, oh yeah, I don't watch anymore, um, and most of them find that solution through white knuckling it. They just try to like think about other thoughts or whatever, and we make a pretty big distinction in our program uh, between sobriety and freedom, 
And I think some guys have attained sobriety where they're like, oh, yeah, I don't watch that stuff anymore. But usually an addiction to pornography or any kind of compulsive behavior to something as toxic as porn stems from a deeper rooted issue. Um, and we could go into what that is if, if time allows for it. But the point is that what a lot of people do when they kind of white knuckle it or just willpower their way through is they, they, they kind of like run over the weed with the lawnmower. So yeah, everything looks clean. Like we're sober, we're good. But the root system is just there. It typically just grows a different kind of weed, whether it's alcoholism, workaholism, uh, you know, fill in your blank. There's another vice that people resort to. And that's why that's why I think this message that like I'm such a passionate believer in my own message is because I want to see people free. That's like that's what's biblical. Bibl the Bible doesn't talk about sobriety, but it does say that who the sun sets free is free indeed. And that's that's, I think, where the real money's at. So what do you think it is that makes them kind of white knuckle it? Like, are they afraid that they don't have someone that they can talk to that they trust? Do they not think that their situation, that they can be free of it? Maybe do they not recognize? You're talking about these like past traumas or things that like initiate it. Obviously, there has to be some pretty common ones of like the majority of men. There has to be something that's missing, yeah. right? Because it's like the goal has to be that the alternative to looking at porn, that there's a better, there's something better in return. Right? Yes. Like, there has to be something better in return to not doing that. I think people could see it logically from like working out. It's like working out's difficult, but once you do it, you get something far better in return rather than a temporary missing 30 minutes of a workout to sit home and eat ice cream. You put in 30 minutes and for like 23 hours and 30 minutes, you feel great yeah. because you're like, man, I've like, I've crushed it. I got my endorphins. I look good all the time. There's a lot of benefit to that. But what do you think it is? Like, why do guys struggle with, with either reaching out or getting help or identifying if they have a problem rather than just like mowing over the weed? I think, uh, I mean, the two things that come to mind for me are there's definitely a pride thing in guys. I think we love, like, even think about entrepreneurship. Like, we love the the bootleg uh, shoestring budget stories, right? Of people that just hustled and grinded their way through. And so I think we tend to just transfer that into other areas. We, we'd love to just believe we can do it on our own. And um, I think that's a, that's a pride issue. It's not exclusively male, but I think men are a bit more prone to it. Um, and then the other element is like, we always just choose the path of least resistance, right? Like, sure, I could, I could sign up for a program, get a coach, plug into a community. But man, that's so much work. That's going to cost me time. That might cost me some money. I have to be vulnerable with people I don't know. Uh, most people are would just rather do it on their own. They're, they would at least start there. Um, and th those are the reasons I did it on my own. I tried doing it on my own for, I don't know, two, three years. You know, And I had an internet filter. Like I had some things. I was doing the stuff. But yeah, none of it was really getting to the roots of the issue. And that's that's sort of the the dilemma of it is like, if you really want to get to the heart of the matter, any kind of heart transformation always involves community. It always involves other people. So, so, so I before think, you get to the root real quick, like I, I want yeah. you to anchor me back to the root. Take me through your cycle and other people's cycle that you see yeah. that they kind of go through. Because like when we've talked before about addiction, um, I've had like my fair share of everything from like pornography to weight, like I was 60 pounds heavier. Like I had plenty of ex ones that were public. And ones that weren't public, right? Like being overweight, it's pretty easy for people to see that you have an issue. Right. Uh, whereas pornography, you could you could hide it in a lot of different ways, right? So, so for you, like when we had talked about it before, it's like guys will maybe mess up. Maybe they over drink alcohol. They do a drug that they shouldn't. They look at things they shouldn't. Whatever it is, and then usually they feel really bad and they say they want to change. So then they white knuckle it. They do it for a week. They think I'm fine. I feel better now. The pain's gone. Like yeah. what was your cycle and what's the common cycle that you see from other guys that they go through before they ever, ever end up working with you. And then I want you to go into the key deep roots and then, and then some of the things that they can do to get free. Okay. So the typical cycle, this was, this was my cycle. And this is the, the cycle most guys fall into is uh, denial. So I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Um, it's not really that big of a problem. I only watch it occasionally. Then there's an awareness that, okay, I have a problem. And so it's it's some quick solutions. It's the internet filter. It's I'm going to pray a little bit more. I'm going to try to read my Bible every day. 
Uh, maybe they'll get a resource, you know, start listening to a podcast or a book, that kind of thing. And then typically you have the, the, okay, this is, I need to do more because it's failed, right? They've gone, like you said, the week clean, two weeks clean, what month clean, but it's kind of like an elastic band. They just end up snapping back to their norm. And then there's, it's, it's just gradually, I need more, I need more, I need more. And so people, people will do, you know, maybe they'll do the accountability partner thing for a bit. They'll confess it to their pastor. And the confessional part is is huge, right? Like that really gets the ball rolling. But a lot of people make the mistake of stopping there. They're like, oh, perfect. I'm done. Like confess it to my pastor or confess it to my wife and I should be good to go now. Um, but that really is like, I don't know, it's like a spark plug. Like it kind of gets things rolling. But if you really want the momentum, um, obviously you have to you have to do the work to actually get to the roots. So by the time people come to us, they've tried a bunch of stuff. They've read the books. They've maybe even tried a course before. They've tried therapy. Um, you know, they've done they've done some things along the way, and they just feel like nothing's really getting them the momentum they want. Does that make sense? Yeah, and and their pattern is that they obviously continue to to fall into it over and over again. Seems like a common pattern. Yeah. I'm just trying to think like, you know, what's going to get guys that are listening to this? The majority of them are looking at porn. They have an issue with it. They maybe they. But like there's something that's kept them from doing anything about it. Yeah. Or like, like, does, do they really need to be that public about it to transform? Like, that's a good question as well. Is like, is it required that everyone knows about your issues to change? Because maybe some of them think like, well, the reason I don't want to change is because like, I'm going to see if I can just do this without anyone knowing. And maybe there is a way that they could transform without everyone in the world knowing that they have some like hidden deep struggle like you know obviously there's there's scriptures around like confessing your sin before other people so yeah. that you could be healed yet it doesn't say confess your sin to everyone <laughs> exactly healed, right so like what does that look like yeah i mean and i think that's that's a really important point is we're not i'm not saying that you have to be public about it i'm just saying you have to find some safe trusted people that are not going to judge you that you can have some real conversations with um, the, the caveat here is if you're married, um, and I do want to speak to the married guys really quick. If you're married and you have this in your life, you have two options. There's only two ways this ends. Either you confess or you get caught. And the things that you fear the most, like a lot of people don't confess because they're like, she's going to be super pissed. What if she leaves me? Uh, no, it's a really bad time for her. You know, she's, she's got stuff going on with her mom and I don't want to, you know, pile onto her, whatever. Guys come up with all kinds of excuses. All the stuff that you're afraid of happening, if you were to confess, are very unlikely to happen because when you confess, it actually shows a, a degree of integrity. It actually, even though it kind of is a withdrawal in the relationship, it also puts a deposit in. It says, I care enough that I want it to come clean. But if you get caught, all bets are off the table. And we have seen we have seen the worst of it. We've seen some really bad situations of you know wives wives leaving because there was other mistrust, but then they find this stuff on the computer and it's the last straw. Um, those stories are actually are actually pretty common, but there's more extreme ones. But man, all the stuff that that a guy is afraid of as he's hearing that when he's like, I have to tell her it. Um, whatever you're afraid of is very unlikely to happen if you actually own it. If you get caught, things get a lot worse. So I think that. That's the one thing that I think people sometimes lose sight of is because they've gone so long. They're, it's like I'm eight years into my marriage. It, we're we're fine, you know, as far as as far as we're concerned. It's like, well, no, you're not because you have this huge hidden secret. But number two, you're actually a ticking time bomb. That's what your marriage is. It's just a matter of time, and uh, whether it's sooner or later, it only gets worse if you don't confess it. What about all these dudes that are preaching? And I say dudes, but probably both. There's a lot of dudes out there that are preaching that they have sex with a bunch of different chicks. I don't know a ton that are preaching like whack off to porn. Um, I don't think yeah. that's a really big like popular movement. <laughs> I think I think even in general, people are like, oh, that's probably not the best thing. Desensitizes you. Uh, I think I even saw an article that popped up on my feed about that. Like, um, like a lot of a lot of guys can't even get a boner if they're like a like a guy who not just looks at porn, but guys who work in the porn industry. Like it's not even something that they enjoy. There is no, no they, enjoyment. They need injections. Anything. Yeah, they need injections and all that injections, stuff. Injections, bro. Not really. <laughs> so, so like from from that side, like what's your opinions on on that type of stuff? You know, people that 
for a lot of the guys I'm talking to, like they're either preparing for marriage, they want to get married, they're in, they're currently married, and the majority of them are probably married. And yeah. so that's what's scarier to me is like the more things you have in your life, marriage, kids, the more ramifications there are from the hidden addiction. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like they probably should be having sex with their wife a lot more than they probably are. And like, there's a lot of things with that, you know, yeah. if you're like having, I don't know, just weird. Like, it just seems like there's so many ramifications of it. So for you, what are your thoughts on people that are like, just guys can have sex with a bunch of different chicks and all of that? Well, I, I mean, I think it just depends on what you really want in life. Like, you know, the like we have three pillars of recovery, self-awareness, transformation of the heart, and the third is identity, establishing your identity in Christ. And the identity piece is where a lot of people really start to get breakthrough because they start to realize the person God's made them to be. And it's interesting, if you dig into the research, uh, if you listen to a guy like Jordan Peterson, who's, you know, very studious, um, but, you know, like obviously like pretty straightforward with his messaging as well, um, he'll be the first one to tell you that the whole kind of polygamous approach to relationship does not work for the human psyche. Like, like if you pull apart the morality and the spirituality of the conversation, people are less satisfied. They have less fulfilling relationships. And in general, their overall quality of life is a lot poorer. And the main reason is because there's actually a depth of character and manhood required to preserve one relationship long term. And a lot of guys, like our society is settling for fake intimacy through things like pornography and things like, you know, polygamy or promiscuity in the name of like, oh, you know, it's your life. You can do whatever you want. And for some reason, we just think like a guy is better if he's got a higher hit count. But the reality is like, like truly in this society um, and in a human wiring, if you want to have a healthy society, if you want to have healthy men, then you teach them how to be strong and committed relationships. The bane of pornography from a neurological standpoint is that you get a high reward for little to no effort. And any time that your brain gets high reward for no effort, you end up creating a toxic cycle. It's like a negative feedback loop. So that's like, like a get rich quick scheme. Like I'm sure you've seen this, Nicholas, like anybody who makes really good money too quickly in their business, you probably have a degree of concern for them, right? Because you're like, that was almost a little bit too easy and you don't realize how hard it actually is to be an entrepreneur, right? And and that's when that's where you get these stories of like, hey, whatever happened to so-and-so, they were a flash in the pan. Well, yeah, they got high reward, but they weren't really actually put in the effort and because they weren't willing to put in the effort, none of it became sustainable long term. Not only the business or the relationship or whatever, but even just that person's character, that person's sense of self and identity, what actually preserves those things long term is being able to put in the hard work to get your high rewards as opposed to trying to find you know some get rich quick scheme or some cheap way out of it. You, you had talked about earlier that there's people that white knuckle it and you said the difference between sobriety and freedom. When I look mm -hmm. at this in other areas, you know, it's like alcoholism, there's like AA, right? And AA's common thing is like, I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Right? Which is a very like strong term to, to walk with your entire life is to be like, I am an alcoholic. That would be sobriety, right? That'd be like somebody who says like, I'm addicted to porn, even I, and I haven't wa watched it or been a part of it for 12 years. Yeah. Like, shoot, like, you're walking around that identity for your whole life. That seems really difficult. And it seems like culturally, like a lot of people are just afraid of relapse, a lot of fear-based stuff. Uh, yeah. What's Walk me through that difference of how can guys experience freedom? What are some tactics you have rather than the sobriety? Because like, I think every guy here would be like, man, freedom, like that'd be insane. That'd be so weird to like <laughs> to have that in any area, right? For pornography, I want to hear that. Because mm -hmm. I relate it to, let's say, abundance over scarcity. If someone's like, man, if I just wasn't afraid anymore and didn't have to fight that feeling, that would be like freedom, not fighting my fear of failure. I'm like, just having excitement for success. So how do we walk from sobriety to, to actual freedom? Yeah, sobriety really focuses on the behavior, right? It's how many, it's street counting, how many days have you gone? It's, you know, it's trying to put the blocker on the screen because that's where you're having your relapses. Sobriety, uh, sorry, so, so sobriety is a matter of behavior. Freedom is a matter of the heart. So freedom is, is where you are identifying the underlying causes of why this thing, why this weed is growing in your garden in the first place 
and then tackling things from the ground up. So the way that we encourage people to do that is the three pillars I mentioned. And each of these pillars has a mantra, which I think might drive this home a little bit. So the first pillar is self-awareness. And the mantra for self-awareness is if you are not aware, it cannot be repaired. So building that understanding, like when I say someone's heart, I'm talking about getting in touch with your inner life. You don't have to be touchy-feely about it, but just being able to pay attention to what are the things you're feeling, what are the things that you're thinking about, um, what are some of the deeper fundamental desires that are driving your behavior, really helpful. The second pillar is transformation of the heart. And our motto there is he who is most vulnerable heals the quickest. So this goes back to the thing we were talking about earlier. Like vulnerability is the thing we all resist because we figured there's got to be an easier way. For most guys, it is the key to their freedom is finding a safe environment where they can actually be vulnerable. That's where the healing really takes place. And then our third pillar is identity. And our motto there is or our mantra is I would rather be 100% my true self and rejected than 80% my true self and accepted. And so we're teaching our guys to to walk in like radical identity, radical self-confidence, where they are unashamedly their true selves. And that's the beautiful byproduct of going through a process where you focus on freedom in the heart instead of just modifying your behavior and achieving sobriety. So let's say someone were to go through some of your programs. How do you walk them through the navel gazing of just being vulnerable? Like, man, like I messed up. Like, I'm sure you go through this all the time with your your people. You have people that maybe instantly change. And then like, what's your type of communication with them after they're like, they're fine. You're like, yeah, high five, like amazing. But you have also guys that maybe sit there and like, keep just looking at, man, I messed up. I can't trying to be vulnerable, but they never really get out of their funk. How do you guys deal with that? That's a great question. It definitely happens a lot because I think, uh, I think vulnerability has just become such like a, a mainstream term that we've diluted its meaning a little bit. The reality is like if you're – so this is what we'll say to our clients. If you're in a program to get free of porn, it actually doesn't require any vulnerability to share that you had a relapse, right? Like that's literally why everybody's there. Like there's no vulnerability. Vulnerability always comes with the cost. And the word that we actually prefer to use – I say vulnerability because you know people know what, what you mean when you say that. My preferred term is transparency. And transparency is more like I'm letting you see see me for what I'm worth. So it's one thing to say, yeah, I had a slip last week. It's another thing to say, my wife and I have been fighting and uh, we haven't really had a lot of sex lately and I'm feeling a bit rejected by her and I'm actually pretty upset at her and it was kind of a vengeance thing that I thought I'll go watch porn and kind of get mine that way. That's vulnerability, right? Like that's where you're like, okay, yeah, we can we can work with something like that. And somebody who's who's consciously making that effort on a consistent basis to really be seen, to be transparent that way, they they recover so much more quickly because once you let those layers back and you still receive acceptance and unconditional love, which you would you would in an environment like King's Brotherhood or like what we're building, man, that's like as healing as it gets. And that's why identity naturally develops after that because people just become confident in who they are. And, and you had just touched on something that you talked about earlier. This guy, you, you gave an example of a guy with his wife, they're in a fight or whatever, and they don't have sex. And so he's like, I'm going to go get mine somewhere else or whatever and get back at her, whatever that is. It kind of goes back to what you talked about, like the core root causes. Yeah. Like, is it mommy issues? Is it daddy issues? Is it like, what, what's like the core... Like, is it rejection? Is it like self-esteem? What's, what's the thing that is driving men this way? You know, like what's, what are the core things that, that trigger the men to go down this direction? Yeah, really, really uh, important question. So I would say there's three categories. So one is definitely trauma. That's where you would have like your mommy issues, daddy issues, quote unquote. Uh, for me, it was, it was definitely mom issues. And um, I have an amazing mom. Pardon? I said, sorry, mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've had, a, we've had a very transparent conversation about this, so it's all good. But um, she was a great mother. Like it, it, it wasn't like she abandoned me or something like that. But there were dynamics that really, um, that I would say led to some of my misbehavior. So trauma is uh, one category. Relationship dynamics would be another one. And when I say relationship dynamics, what I'm talking about is feelings of rejection, uh, feelings of abandonment, uh, isolation, uh, these kinds of things are really uh, like quite pivotal and typically at play. And then the third category would be beliefs. And oh, for me, one of my big beliefs was just never feeling good enough. 
I uh, grew up in an Indian home where like, you know, they're like, they just cracked the whip on academics and uh, high performance that way. And I was a high achieving kid. I mean, I skipped grade two, finished grade 12 with a 95 average, you know, I had like a 3.8 GPA honors degree by the time I was 20. It was never good enough. It was never enough. And um, porn was a place where uh, I felt accepted. So no risk of rejection there. Uh, porn was a place where I felt good enough. Like if I'm being accepted, I must be good enough. And it just started to feed into some of those more core root issues of mine. And you can see how that's what actually makes it so addicting. Like, sure, you have the dopamine cycles and all this stuff going on neurologically. But at a heart level, it's satiating some of those more fundamental core needs that drive a lot of our behavior. And um, the, the, the belief thing, like the way you see yourself, it, that was the big one for me. So trauma, relationship, beliefs, uh, typically it falls into one of those three categories. So let's say some of the guys leave here today and no matter what their thing is, they're feeling stressed or they get, they, you know, don't perform at the level they're supposed to, or they feel rejected or any of the things that you just talked about and they yeah. automatically have a desire to do something. What, how do they handle that situation? They, they now are aware of it. So like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, you know, like I want to do X, Y, Z. What's a decision that they can make leaving here to make a positive decision in the right direction yeah so there's a there's a couple practical things that every guy should be equipped with in those moments these are not the things that are going to fix things long term long term like i think the message is clear like you have to figure out why that why that's there where it's coming from and do the roots but if you catch yourself in the moment a uh, couple things you can do so number one breathe really really powerful when you feel triggered or you feel an urge come up that is an activity of the limbic part of your brain, the more primal part. And what happens is the, the frontal part of your brain, which is responsible for good decision making, becomes inactive. The quickest way to reactivate that is a nice deep belly breath. A couple of them, really, really good. Second thing, this is super underrated but unbelievably impactful, change your environment. Just stand up and walk away. It takes a lot of – it actually is really hard to do that in the moment when you're triggered but it really does change things. Your brain is so responsive to its environment. And then the third thing would be, if you have this established, reach out to somebody, call somebody. Uh, in our program, we don't do accountability partners, but we do have um, spotters. So kind of like a spotter at the gym, it's the same concept. They're not doing the heavy lifting, but they are there to give you that little push when you need it. And so if you have someone like that in your life set up where you can just call them when you're tempted, get them to talk you through it. It doesn't usually take that long, maybe two to three minutes max. Uh, but something like that's really powerful. Or we have guys post in our online community. So there's other ways you can do it. But those would be three really easy ways for you to dissipate a moment. And then on the back end, when you have a bit more time, you should be journaling about it, talking to somebody about it, getting a little bit more insight as to why that's happening when you feel stressed. So good, dude. So last thing, and I want to thank you. And I know you have your book that people can go grab and, and we want to list those resources. And I want to make sure they get connected. Sure. You you said you were addicted for 15 years. How long have you been like free or helping people? Uh, okay, so uh, free since uh, February 2016. So about seven years. Um, and Deep Clean has been around for about four years, I think it is. Yeah. Got it. So so four years talking about it. How have you protected yourself, right? Because you could have been free lived your life, never really went back into those situations. Yeah. And, but now you're having to dip back into this like place that you struggled with for so long. And I think yeah. for a lot of business owners and guys out there, a lot of times, like I've quoted for mess to message, it's like you had a mess, you overcame it. But the way that you communicate with everyone is by dipping back into that reality and like sharing that with them. How do you protect yourself and also deal with uh, the, the pressure of like, if you were to screw up again, like, that's like, that would suck, right? And you don't want, yeah. and you don't want to keep your, I mean, it's not necessarily gone, but you don't want to just be not looking at porn because if you do, it'll hurt your company. Like that doesn't go in freedom. That's more sobriety, right? Yeah. So like, how have you managed that over the years of you got free, you then started preaching the freedom, but you now have to deal with guys that are talking about porn, looking at porn, dealing with porn all the time. You have to dip back into those situations and talk about all this trauma that you had been through before and yeah. communicate that. How do you keep yourself fresh, accountable, and walking in freedom with all of that? Man, 
Man, that's a that's a fantastic question. So, uh, I mean, the three pillars, I am absolutely sold on them. Like, I think they change people's lives. And they're the things that I still work on every day. So building my self-awareness, uh, really trying to manage my stress responses and how I'm responding to people, getting a good awareness of what's going on within me. Uh, that second pillar, healing of the heart. So trying to find safe places where I can be vulnerable. That's why community is so powerful. And it's not, you don't just do community while you're in recovery. Uh, you're meant to have community your entire life. And so having places where I can be vulnerable and transparent is really, really valuable. And then the identity piece as well, um, super, just super useful. Like I have to regularly chip away at my identity. I dismantle the, you know, limiting beliefs and all that kind of stuff. But if there's one thing I could really leave your audience with, Nicholas, it would it would be this. Um, and I learned this when my wife and I were dating. Uh, we had really strict um, lines as far as our physical interactions when we were dating because we had both messed up in the past, um, and we didn't we didn't want to do that in our future relationships. So we weren't actually even kissing at the time. And I had probably been clean for about two years, and it was a really stressful time. Like like I mentioned, she was she was sick, uh, she was bedridden. Um, Oh, I may not have mentioned that, but she was she was sick when I was engaged. Um, and then I'm trying to think of what else was going on. I had a bit of a career crisis. This was when I, I was starting to switch ladders, you know, from like being in the nine to five and trying to figure out what the entrepreneur stuff was. But um, a really stressful day, and um, it was date night. And I remember that whole day, all I could think about was I want to watch porn. I want to watch porn. And I had been clean for two years, so I really didn't have these moments very often. But this day was bad. It was really intense. And so I picked her, picked my wife up. We're going back to my apartment and I'm kind of connecting the dots. I'm like, okay, I've been like pretty much turned on the whole day. We're going to be alone in the apartment. We have this boundary that we've actually upheld. You know, we were like a, a year into, uh, into dating rather and hadn't kissed. And I was like, this, this is a recipe for disaster. But yeah. I was internalizing all of it. Like I wasn't, I, I, I don't know. Like I, I, I was doing all the things I know I shouldn't be doing. I, I wasn't talking about it and whatever. And so we're in the driveway and, all of a sudden, it, it just clicks. I'm like, oh, duh. Like, Sathya, the thing that got you out of this was opening up to people. Like, you need to tell her what's going on. And so just as she was getting in the car, I was like, hey, babe, um, oh, I, I just need to let you know, like, I've been feeling really tempted to watch porn today. And I'm a little bit worried that, you know, I'm going to make a mistake um, when we hang out tonight. And she looked at me with a smile on her face. And she was like, I'm honestly so glad that you told me. That just, like, tells me how much you trust me. Um, don't worry, I'll pick up the slack tonight. And it was just a simple response, but she was so composed about it. She really appreciated the honesty. And I just learned in that moment that I would rather confess a temptation than confess a mistake. And and I think that's that's been a huge part of preserving what God has done in my heart and in my life is just keeping close accounts, being upfront about like the little things, nipping them in the bud before they develop into something more. Those are the kinds of things that go a long way. And, and that's why we teach what we teach. That's awesome, man. You're, you're lucky that she wasn't like, me too, let's go inside. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, oh my gosh, like, that would have gone well. Like, could have oh could gone south quick, yeah. Yeah, could, it could have for sure. Um, but, but it's cool just to hear the dynamic how you did that. So for the guys out there that want to get com more connected to your stuff, I know you have some free resources. You have your book that they can go through. Uh, I really think that, that you had talked about addiction in, in a lot of different ways before. I, I like the the definition of are you skipping things? Are you desiring it all the time? Is it taking a, you it a, is it taking you away from your priorities? Yeah. Do you feel, I think uh, w one thing that we we've used a lot at King's Brotherhood is like is when you do it afterwards, how do you feel? Right? Because you could mm. like, eating bad food isn't necessarily bad. But when you don't plan it correctly or you do it outside of your boundary, a lot of times what happens is that you feel really bad afterwards. Yeah. So I'm like, hey, take into account how you feel after you do it. Because there's also different lines, right? Pornography is like, is like a good line. You're like, I know that's wrong. Whereas like eating ice cream, it's like, it's not necessarily bad unless it is, right? So it's like, you know, a lot of people can eat it. It's not bad and they make themselves feel bad about it. Yeah. There's other people that eat it bad and they don't feel anything about it. It's like, ah, oh, like that's, it's a difficult addiction, right? I'm sure people go through it with alcohol. You know, that's what's weird is like, a, I have a person that we'll just say they have want, they, they wanted to work with our company and 
they had struggled with alcoholism and I was really trying to like get myself in their shoes. Cause I was like, man, like I've never really like sat there. Like I need to drink alcohol. Like it's never been a thing. And like my father has gone through that, right? Like big time. My dad mm-hmm. used to drink like a ton. And, and I think that probably sent me experience. And my wife had brought up to me like, no, it's like, it's like where you, you crave it you need it. You can't, you don't, you really can't live without it. It's the thing that you look forward to, but like the thing you beat yourself up for. And I was like, man, like it's crazy. So I know that a lot of guys can get some stuff. Where can they grab your book? Where can they get more connected to stuff you're doing? Yeah. So, uh, the book would be a great place to start. That's kind of our blueprint for recovery. Uh, and we give it away for free. So it's the last relapse Uh, and then we also have a daily podcast. So obviously if people are listening, they're podcast people, especially if they made it to this part of the show. Uh, so that's called Unleash the Man Within, and we do daily episodes. Um, so that's a place for people to just get some more tips, get some more insights, and some more help in this area. What are some of the topics, like a common topic or something that you guys talk about on the podcast? Well, what we typically do is we actually listen to the questions that people ask in our coaching calls, and then we answer them. Well, obviously, we answer them in the call, but then we'll just like create content based on that. Because I figure if my clients are asking that, my listeners probably are too. So any any question you've ever had about recovery – anything sex related or certainly related to pornography, we've probably done an episode on it. So if you're a guy out there and you want to see if there's other people that have similar questions to what you ask, go check out the podcast. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I know that you had said something about that. It's not easy for people to like, if you're a guy and you're going out there and you're downloading all this get free from porn stuff, people are gonna be like, well, what's wrong with you? I'm like, bro, if you've been able to hide your browser for this long, you can hide your podcast episodes. That you're listening to as well. <laughs> Feel free yeah, to true. delete them after you listen to Sophia's podcast. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, if you made it this far deleting stuff, like it's okay to delete some podcasts and go check them out and see what type of questions that other people are asking. I appreciate it, dude. Thank you for the work that you're doing, the, the way that you're helping support people out there in the world that are struggling with different types of addictions and giving them not sobriety, but freedom. Go grab his book. Go check out the podcast and see what type of questions fit with what you're going through and see if it doesn't spark something for you. Don't go through the lie in your life thinking, I already know the answer to this. I get messages from guys all the time that are like, I already know what I'm struggling with. I know I'm just a lazy piece of crap and I know what I should be doing, but I'm not doing it. And I already know the answer that you're going to give me. And I'm like, bro, like you're talking to yourself. Like, don't, <laughs> don't think that you already know the answers that Sathya and their podcasts are going to. I know I just need to quit. I know that it's that I'm messed up. I know that I just need you no, know, like go see if you can get an epiphany, a revelation that walks you into freedom by yeah. checking out Sathya's podcast. So thank you, Sathya, for being here. This has been amazing. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. <laughs>